Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where the great beast has finally reared its ugly head and shown us its true form, and it is... Well, maybe not as beastly as some may have thought. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Whether it's your first time or your 93rd, thanks for checking this thing out. And no matter how many shows you've been here for, I've been here for 93, and what better way to honor that 93rd episode than by talking about the life and work of the... Wait, wait, what was that? Ah, yes, the notorious Alistair Crowley, the great beast himself, the wickedest man in the world. The man who's performed more sex magic rituals than there are pages in the book we're about to discuss. And that's a lot of pages, folks, 705 of them to be exact, in this book called Perturabo by our guest, Dr. Richard Kaczynski. Richard's book, Perturabo, is considered by most to be the definitive biography of Aleister Crowley. Richard is also the author of The Wiser Concise Guide to Aleister Crowley. He's been a student of the Western Hermetic tradition since 1978 and has lectured internationally on these topics since 1990. His writing has appeared in numerous magazines and books, including High Times, Concordance to the Holy Books of Thelema, and The Golden Dawn Sourcebook. Richard and I are going to essentially make our way nearly chronologically through Crowley's life. And if you're on Patreon, you're getting nearly two hours of show here. But if you're not, you're only getting the first hour. And of all the shows you want to hear in their entirety, this is the one because you're only getting half the story here. Patreon.com slash O-Culture is the destination for the whole shebang, and it's as little as two bucks a month. But enough prologue. Let's flip this script to dialogue and see if that... No, no, no talk. Yeah, let's see if that label still sticks on Mr. Crowley after a long, hard look at perhaps the most influential figure, or at least one of them, in the history of O-Culture. Enjoy. (laughs) Dr. Richard Kaczynski, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. No problem, man. I I really appreciate you being here. I'm not a long-time fan of your work. Just recently I was introduced to it from a mutual friend of ours named Alexandra. I think you know her, and uh, yep. she's she had high marks for your Crowley biography, so I picked it up, and I thought, this is the guy I want to talk to for episode 93 of this show, so it really does mean a lot that you took some time here to do this. And to be on episode 93 also is very cool. Absolutely, man, yeah. And before we get into the book, though, tell us a little bit about yourself and you know how you came, I guess, to write perhaps the definitive biography of Alistair Crowley. Where on your journey did you first encounter the great beast himself? Well, I first encountered Crowley when I was about 14 years old, and I had started hanging out at the local occult bookshop and kind of went from zero to 60 very quickly. You know, I showed up there, you know, this is this is in the 70s. It was a time where things like In Search Of, you know, was this you know paranormal TV show narrated by Leonard Nimoy, and there were books on UFOs and things like that and in the grocery stores and stuff like that. So this the stuff was all very mainstream. And I took my bike to the local occult bookshop one time, wanted to pick up a book on Nostradamus. Then then the second time I was there I picked up Israel Regardi's The Golden Dawn. And then when I came back, the the bookstore owner who for some reason took me under his wing And that's a whole other story, but he said, well, if you like The Golden Dawn, you want to read this. And he pulled out the, you know, the Dover paperback edition of Magic and Theory and Practice. And um, I was just intrigued by the book. It it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at first reading, but I knew it meant something. And it was like a puzzle that needed to be unlocked. And so I began studying Crowley and his works uh, kind of from that point on. And... During a trip to San Francisco in about 1988, I think it was, that um, a a new Crowley biography had come out. Um, I really want to get into which one it is, but um, it was picked it up with great you know eagerness and found it to be dreadful. And as I read this, I thought, you know, I could do a better job than this. And this little voice in my head said, "Why don't you?" And so I did. And it wound up being 
just an enormous job, um, just doing all the research, tracking down archival material, writing it up, and then finding a publisher. It was just a very long, long journey. Because uh, the, the first edition didn't come out until 2002, I believe. So uh, again, if I had started this around 1990, you know, it was kind of 12 years before it finally came out. And yeah, it was a, it was a heck of a journey. You know, two two things I really wanted to accomplish with the book were um, I wanted to respond to so many of the other biographies I had read at that time had this sensationalistic tone, and I felt that the voice of the narrator and the narrator's opinions were getting in the way of things. And I just wanted to tell the story. I just wanted to lay out the facts and say this is this is what happened to this guy's life and let the reader form their own opinion. I I I prefer to think that readers are intelligent people and they don't need me to tell them what to think. I just want to tell the story transparently. And I also kind of wanted to try and set the story out in some sort of a chronological way that a lot of the other books beforehand had treated things a little bit more uh, episodically. And there's like a lot of overlap between things. And when you do that, the, the sequence of events gets kind of cloudy, particularly things that happened later in his life, which weren't covered in his own autobiography. So that took a lot more digging and research to fill in you know, the last you know, nearly 30 years of his life, you know, which had kind of, kind of been neglected in previous biographies. So hopefully I accomplished those two things. I would say you did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can tell that the book is meticulously researched. It's almost 700 pages or maybe even more, actually. I mean, a lot of notes at the end. I guess the main narrative's about 500 some pages. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty in-depth biographical treatment. It does accomplish, I think, what you set out to accomplish. And I was curious, though, are you a, a devotee of Crowley? Do you follow his teachings? Are you a member of the OTO or anything like that? I... I... Hey, I'm a member of OTO. I don't make a secret of that. Um, you know, generally, I you know present myself as one or the other. It's, it can kind of become hard to mix the planes. You know, the, the idea of the scholar practitioner, for instance, is a, a very controversial one in, in the study of Western esotericism. For instance, you'll hear this debate about the emic versus the etic approach, or you know, being a participant observer, and do you actually compromise your objectivity? Um, and I, I find that, that argument to be a little you know, ridiculous, perhaps, and that you know, no one would say that you know, Gershom Sholem shouldn't be writing about the Kabbalah, you know, and no one should be saying that you know, Jesuits shouldn't be writing about the history of Christianity, but somehow when you get to occultism, it's just like, well, if you have any, you know, if you participate in this at any point or in any way, you are somehow not qualified to be a scholar in this in this arena. And uh, I actually find it's quite the opposite that a lot of things written by people who do who do not have some sort of practical experience kind of lack, lack the, the depth of understanding of the material. And it's very easy when you do that to make you know basically rookie mistakes. So I think that's a, it's a double-edged sword there. You know, some people have accused me of you know being overly sympathetic, but I really think I've tried to just kind of step back and just be as hands-off and, and objective as possible. But you know, that's you know each reader can decide that for themselves. Definitely, yeah. So before we get into uh, Curly's life here, I want to preface you know my side of this by saying, and this is not an uncommon thing, but I do have some issues, some character concerns with him, but. His life story is a fascinating character study, nonetheless. And that said, uh, your biography of Crowley, and correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but it's called Perdurabo. It's an awesome treatment. It, it reads like a novel in a lot of sections. And based on Crowley's nature, I mean, some of them parts very well could be fictionalized or at the least embellished. But the opening scene really <laughs> drew me in. It was really mysterious and riveting and kind of set the tone for the whole book. So let's start there, actually, because... You reveal this name right up front, Perturabo. Take us through that opening scene in the book and what that name means. All right. Well, the opening scene is uh, depicting Aleister Crowley's initiation into the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And this was the day that he considered to be his magical birthday. And he marked the occasion every year in his diary and in his life until the day he died. So this was, again, a very important day for him. And that's kind of, and, and so we begin with 
what he's experiencing and thinking about in the initiation. And, you know, he has, he has written letters saying that, you know, he didn't know what to expect. And they thought that, you know, he very much could die. And I think it was perhaps being a little dramatic in, in saying that, but at the same time, there's, there is that uh, heightened anxiety and stress that is part of an initiatory experience. And, you know, and again, kind of going back to our earlier comment that, really touches on this idea that there is a great deal of value in being kind of the, the participants in, in the things that you're writing about, because I, I think it would be very difficult to write about an initiation experience if you have not had one. And, you know, I remember somebody asked, well, how did they know that, you know, how did Richard know that Crowley's throat was dry, you know, and, I, and all I could say was, ah, you've never been initiated, have you? You know, so there's, you know, uh, there, there's these thoughts that, you know, you know, pretty much universally go through someone's head when they're, when they're awaiting, you know, the, the ceremony to begin. And that's, that's, again, where the book begins. And, you know, suddenly, you know, he gets called in, the door opens, and the ceremony proceeds, and we're off to the races. And um, as part of the, you know, Golden Dawn initiation uh, or process, you know, each new initiate would pick a, a magical motto of some sort. And the idea is that this motto would represent or symbolize the initiate's aspirations, um, either as an initiate in general or specifically for the degree that they had just taken. So sometimes, you know, you, you see in Crowley's life that he takes in a new motto for each degree, but, you know, he throughout his life continued to refer to himself by his neophyte motto, which was Perdurado, the title of the book. You know, it was uh, so important to him that that was why I ch chose that as the title of the book. You know, it may not roll off the tongue you know, as as nicely as some of the other titles out there, but I thought it was very, you know, it was really key to who he was, you know, as a, a human being and as a magician and, and as prophet, poet, whatever you want to call him. And uh, the name Perdurabo is Latin. It's a phrase that means I shall endure to the end. And it uh, is a reference to a biblical quote. Um, I don't recall the passage offhand, but it's something to the effect of, for he who endures to the end shall enter the kingdom of God or something like that. So that was, that was how Crowley characterized himself. He would, he would endure to the end. And throughout the book, you see that he, in fact, does endure an awful lot. And one of the things I think that's very interesting about Crowley's character is that, you know, you might think he's a terrible person or a con man or, you know, whatever impression you might get of him. But I think the thing that comes out is that he genuinely believed in what he saw as his mission here on earth. And despite the hardships, despite being attacked in the press, despite you know, running out of money toward the end of his life. Uh, despite all of that, he, he never wavered from what he saw as his mission in life. I mean, he did indeed endure to the end. And um, so, again, I think that was the, the perfect way to, to title the book and to sum up and characterize really what his life was all about. Yeah, you do have to give him credit for his dedication and commitment to his cause. I mean, you can't really deny that for sure. You know, in his youth, was a bit abnormal, but in the complete opposite way that you'd expect. He grew up in a, a pretty well-off family, financially speaking. What were the Crowleys into exactly? Like, how did they build their fortune? Well, that's that's kind of an interesting tale in of itself. And I actually spend a fair amount of time talking about the family history uh, in the beginning of the book, and that might seem like a lot of attention to that kind of detail, but. You know, it's not really unusual for a, bi for a biography to do that. And I think in Crowley's case, it was very important because the the two things that really, really shaped his life from an early age were the, the family fortune and, and the family's religion. And so setting up how that all came to be was, to be very critical. And you know, it turns out that his grandfather uh, had gotten into, and, and, and in his grandfather's siblings had gotten into the brewing business. Um, they had started this company called Crowley's Ales. And uh, not only were they, did they were they very successful in that endeavor, but they also set up these, these little shops to sell the ales. And along with the ales, they would 
sell these little lunches. And it essentially introduced into British culture the idea of a pub lunch so that people on their work break could go get a, you know, get a pint and have a, have a snack and get back to work again. And that's where they made their fortune. And um, when that, that fortune then passed on to, you know, the you know, Crowley's family, you know, as well. But um, the interesting thing is that the, the family, which had started off as Quakers, you know, Crowley's father converted to this Plymouth Brethren faith and, you know, abstained from alcohol. So he kind of, you know, sold off his shares in the family business and invested them in other things like waterworks and so on. But in addition to the brewing company, the Crowleys were also very much involved in investing in railroads. And these two things kind of went hand in hand in that, you know, the railways were how stock were delivered to various cities in and around London. So um, the, you know, the development of the railway and, and it's reaching out farther and farther into the suburbs, basically, uh, not only did allow them to make money that way, but also allowed them to make money by delivering stock to these more remote regions. So, uh, they, yeah, they did quite well for themselves to a point that when Crowley reached you know, the age of maturity, you know, and when, when he inherited his share of the family fortune, he basically inherited the equivalent of about $6 million, or at least it was about $6 million back in the you know, earlier part of this century. You know, that, that, that number might even be higher at this point. Yeah, and you mentioned his religion, and that did have quite an impact on him in his youth as well, but he seemed to have had an obsession with the concept of sin. At least that's how it came off to me in the book. What was his fascination with this idea? Why did he find that concept of sin so interesting? All right, right. Um, well, the, the religion he was raised in was uh, what is referred to as the Plymouth Brethren. You know, they, they were simply referred to themselves as the Brethren, but you know, outside of that circle, you know, the Plymouth Brethren is kind of a term that's used to identify them. And they're a fundamentalist sect that, you know, again, they, 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 they treat the Bible as literal truth, and they are awaiting the second coming of Jesus literally at any moment. And uh, they live their lives very much based on these uh, core ideas. So Crowley in his confessions talks about how investing, you know, long-term investments were seen as, you know, kind of dimly as, oh, you don't believe that Jesus is about to return. You know, you're, you're planning for the long term. and You know, there's not going to be a long term because Jesus will come any day now and, you know, we will all be raptured. But the, the the brethren faith was very austere. They they did not drink. They did not smoke. They did not really celebrate Christmas the way that you know we think of it. It was very simple um, and and very much concerned with the Bible. Crowley's father was a a lay preacher who traveled around England distributing tracts. Uh, the story is he got so he traveled so widely around the country that he could identify where someone lived based on their accent. And uh, I find it kind of interesting that Crowley in his later life winds up being much like his father, traveling all over the place, distributing his tracts to anyone who wanted to listen. You know, so for as much as you know, Crowley was raised in this very um, you know, rigid Christian kind of background, and he may have you know, ultimately rejected that. Um, you know, the pattern was still set, but um, yeah, it was this. It was this very rigid sort of um, Christianity that he grew up in. His main reading was the Bible. He was very well versed in the Bible. They they would read around the dinner table, you know, at, at the home and so on. And there was a turning point when his father uh, died of cancer of the tongue. Uh, again, kind of ironic for, for a lay preacher to, uh, to, to suffer from that ill. But, uh, you know, it turns out that, th- that the brethren are trying to treat him not through modern medicine, but through homeopathic practices, which didn't help. And uh, it's kind of, you know, it's a, I guess it's a, a pretty classic sort of pat- pattern that for a young boy, I believe Crowley was about 14 when his father died, that he began to act out when his um, uncle, uh, Tom Bond Bishop, tried to kind of step in and kind of take on kind of a guiding paternal role here. You know, there, there were similarities. You know, Tom Bond Bishop was also very much involved in Christian charities and things like that. But rather than idolizing him, Blake Crowley idolized his father. He 
rejected him and, and rebelled against him. And, and it's in this part of that rebellion that, you know, he decided that, you know, he, he wanted to rebel against the, the religion of his upbringing as well. Um, one of the things about the Plymouth Brethren is that they, they were, they were prone to schisms and what would happen is that members of the, of their core group would suddenly split into two you know, divisions as they were called. And then suddenly the people in the other division, the other group were going to hell and then, you know, your division, your people were the only ones who were going to heaven. And this caused a lot of confusion for young Crowley, you know, because he thought, well, how is, how is it that these people are going to heaven? And suddenly they're not, you know, these, these are our family friends. We saw them all the time and now they're going to hell. And so, yeah, he, he, he really got this distasteful sense of, of how religion could be very intolerant. He, he, he suffered from that himself when he was sent to religious schools. And, um, you know, again, the, the death of his father and his rebellion against it just kind of cinched the deal that suddenly he figured rather than being, you know, the, the best Christian ever, he was going to be the, the best sinner ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So there's another angle into this religious and sin conversation, I guess. And, and no surprise, it has to do with sex. But in the book, you describe uh, his, I think it was his first sexual encounter with a female, his family's new parlor maid. And on a Sunday of all days, he seduces her into his mother's bedroom when they're not home. And you said that he saw this as a victory over religious oppression, which I had a nice chuckle at. But it begs the question, we know that Alistair was quite the, the deviant later in life. You know, multiple partners, both male and female, both casually and for magical purposes. But was his youth characterized by the same kind of behavior? I, I think I might hesitate to characterize Crowley's you know, adulthood as, as deviant. Um, you know, we can certainly point to a couple of episodes, but I think it would be, I don't know, it would be over, overstating the case to, to kind of say that characterizes his entire adulthood. I mean, he, you know, he certainly believed in sexual freedom and so on. Um, and then had, you know, multiple partners, but, um, you know, aside from, uh, some, some, from some, some periods where he was engaging in, uh, some taboo breaking, I don't know that he had characterized, him as necessarily particularly freaky, but uh, that's that's uh, another conversation we can certainly still have. But yeah, I, I think that like that incident that you described with you know the the parlor maid in his mom's bed. It's it seems to be a a a, a thing that we do see um, in in Crowley, and, and that it's this this idea of taboo breaking and the idea of breaking a taboo, doing the forbidden thing has a lot of power to it, you know, and obviously it's a thing that has a lot of power when you break the taboo and you can only break the taboo so many times before you're no longer, it's no longer a taboo, you know, but I think these were, you know, maybe not conscious acts, but they were certainly symbolic acts and he remembers them as uh, steps in his liberation and his breaking from kind of the oppressive norms of his upbringing. You know, I think he has like a similar story about, uh, you know, running off and buying tobacco and for, or using the, you know, buying tobacco as kind of a cover up story, you know, for, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the idea of kind of undoing oneself, one's, one's programming and, uh, you know, liberating oneself in that way is certainly a theme in, in Crowley's life. It definitely is. Yeah. And, you know, it's also in his youth that, he develops an interest in some areas that I don't know if the average person knows how much he was really into these subjects, but he catches the poetry bug, which is obvious when you read his later writing. It has a, a very poetic flow and structure to it. And obviously he started his career publishing poetry too. But when did he first develop that interest in that style of writing? Well, it's he, there are examples of him writing poetry fairly young, like in his, in his early teens, and there's, I believe, this poem called Death of a Drunkard, which was a very uh, moralistic, you know, brethren-y like uh, poem um, that he wrote. So he, he seemed to have some, some interest and inclination toward this, but he had not really read, by his own account, you know, any of the great works of poetry until after he went to college, because most works of literature were, were again, subject to approval by, you know, his mother and his, his uncle. 
and and so it's when he gets to college that he's you know out from underneath Gergay and he's able to start buying you know Swinburne and Keats and Shelley and all these other people and sees what he's been missing and begins writing in that style. So it was, it was really, you know, when he, when he went off to school, but he really you know, became acquainted with these poets that he kind of modeled, you know, that he admired and in many ways, you know, modeled himself after, you know, his, his first book, you know, um, Aseldama was published as, you know, a gentleman of the university of Cambridge, you know, which was, you know, famously, you know, of, uh, or a reference to, uh, Keats, I believe, uh, or maybe it was Shelley. Gosh, I'm, I'm terribly getting that one wrong. But who published, you know, a, you know, their first book as a gentleman of the University of Oxford. So he's certainly following in the footsteps of these uh, poets that he admired. So another interest of his in his youth was chess, and he was damn good at it. What made him such a good chess player? You think? Wow, I, I'm not really sure what made him good at it, but there's certainly no question that he was was good. He he had considered pursuing it as a career uh, in fact as, as a youth again he wrote a chess column for a local newspaper and uh he was you know he competed in chess at college he was ranked half blue which is pretty you know good competitive ranking in chess uh, in the in the british university chess ranking system um i'm not a chess expert so i'm not sure exactly you know what what is you know above that but uh you know, again, he's that's that's a you know, again a pretty substantial ranking, and he is, you know, he again he was going to pursue chess as a as a career, and he stopped off on one of his uh, holidays to to observe a chess tournament in Russia, and he thought that it was so dry and boring, he didn't want to do that anymore, but he <laughs> uh, loved the game and continued to play it all his life, and um, you know there are accounts of him being able to to play blind chess meaning that he's not looking at the board, yeah, but he can still call out all of his moves and beat most people, and even to the point where he could actually do, you know, play two or three people blind at the same time. And, yeah, yeah, so he was certainly very good at that, and, and again, enjoyed the game his whole life. So I know scholars and devotees of Crowley know this, but some folks listening may not, but he was what you'd call a mountaineer, a rock climber, chalk cliff climber, sea cliff climber, and turned out he was pretty good at that too. How did he get into that? Because that's a part of his life that, I mean, it's really fleshed out well in the book, kind of throughout his early years into middle age, really, until he gets, I guess, you know, maybe too old to, to do it anymore. It makes quite the impact on him because it, through these circles, it introduces him to the occult too. Right, right. Yeah. And, and again, thank you for noticing the, the attention I give to the climbing stuff because it really was a, a, big deal in his life and it's something that previous biographers just kind of glossed over and there's so much there um and essentially what what had happened to kind of lead to this is um Crowley as a as a youngster you know in, in religious school had you know one of his fellow students had accused him of some sort of impropriety and um, he was expected to confess to this impropriety, but he was not actually presented with any charges. And Crowley, as he tells the tale, you know, had no idea what this is all about, so therefore couldn't confess or admit to anything. And as punishment, he was placed in what was called Coventry, in that he was not allowed to interact with or you know, play with any of the other schoolmates you know, outside of his classes, and was essentially, again, isolated and just fed you know, water and bread. And um, after a while, he took ill and um, he came down with a bad case of albuminuria, and uh, which which was, you know, albumin in the in the urine, and it's the prognosis was not good. And the doctors really thought that he would he would not reach adulthood, and um, he was taken out of school and sent on various rest cures uh, and encouraged to kind of engage in physical activity, such as bicycling. And, you know, in the book, we see how, you know, some of his exploits, you know, just, just doing bicycling for his health, you know, he just, just sort of his, you know, again, some of his emancipation, he winds up with a tutor who introduces him to smoking and drinking. And he realizes that, wow, you, you can do this and not be an awful human being, you know, that this, there's actually like a normal life, outside of his very strict you know, religious upbringing that he had. 
but one of the physical activities that he engaged in was was climbing. And you know, on, on some of his holidays, he had the good fortune to meet some rather famous climbers, and they kind of took him under his wing, and he really took to it and uh, began doing, as you mentioned, all kinds of climbing. You know, not not just you know mountain climbing, but there was you know a whole a whole surge of interest in, in uh, Victorian England at that time and cliff climbing and and so on. And some of these climbs that he took on were pretty tre- treacherous, you know, like the, the, the most famous one is perhaps Beachy Head, which was this cliff, you know, overlooking, um, you know, the sea that was kind of famous for where people would jump off of to commit suicide. It was treacherous because these were chalk cliffs. So as you climb them, the, the chalk is actually just like crumbling and breaking away. So it's, it's uh, very difficult to climb and, and very dangerous. And he had climbed various parts of, you know, above Beachy Head. You know, a lot of the, like, the climbs and the places that he conquered, you know, don't even exist to this day because, you know, of erosion over the past century. But, yeah, I mean, he, he went from not only did he do the chalk cliff climbing, but he also then began climbing mountains in Switzerland and then taking on the Himalayas uh, later in life. So he set a number of world records in climbing that's, that stood for a long time. You know, many of these may be broken at this point, but like one of the records he he set was for um, reaching the highest altitude on um, K2 and for the longest time spent at you know a high altitude. You know, he was the first to climb various mountains, you know, around around the world. So, well, maybe not the very first, but you know, the first in terms of official record keeping, or you know, to you know reach heights that no one else had reached on these peaks. So yeah, that, and and it was through these mountain climbing activities that, uh, as, as you mentioned, two really important contacts came about. One was that while climbing mountains in Switzerland, he encountered someone in, in a local pub talking about alchemy, and it turned out this person was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And it was through this person that he received his introduction to the order, and uh, later he winds up meeting and befriending and climbing with Oscar Eckenstein, who introduces him to just a series of concentration exercises that, you know, while Oscar Eckenstein wasn't exactly in an occultist or a yogi or anything like that, um, he just found that Crow was kind of an undisciplined kind of mind and gave him some exercises that he thought would help him to concentrate. And it just you know, it turns out that a lot of these exercises echo very much exercises in concentration and, and dharana uh, that, that you find in hatha yoga and you know, to, the, to the extent that Crowley actually thought that you know Eckenstein might have been sent to him by the masters as a teacher uh, and Eckenstein also was a collector of the works of Sir Richard Burton who was again another person that Crowley came to very much greatly admire and emulate uh, in his own pursuit of wisdom in the world's traditions so yeah so the, the mountain climbing was something he did really well at and that provided him with skills and introductions that were useful for him in his occult pursuits. Yeah, the guy uh, in the pub that you mentioned was Dr. John Norman Colley, the guy guy talking about alchemy. And, you know, on the mountain climbing too, that's quite esoteric in general. It's it's sort of a, a great metaphor for, you know, spiritual ascension and has been throughout the aeons, really. It, you know, like the old Spielberg, right? The old Paramount. Right, right. Well, there's, there's, yeah, and, and, and there's Mount Abbey Agnes and things like that, too, in spiritual traditions. So certainly uh, it's a potent metaphor that turns up over and again. Yeah, and it's at this point uh, in his early 20s while he's at Cambridge that uh, he begins to see that his interests are really just hobbies, and he wants to immerse himself in something he calls immune from the forces of change. And he concludes that a mystic or a spiritual pursuit is just what he's looking for. And this leads him not long after to the work of A.E. Waite, particularly his book, The Book of Black Magic and of Pax. Can you tell us a bit about Waite and what sort of impact his work had on a young college student? Sure. Well, Waite was one of the preeminent writers on occultism 
at the time that Crowley was learning this material, he would later be involved in the Golden Dawn as well. But it was in A.E. Waite's book of Black Magic and Pacts that he has this introduction where he talks about how throughout the ages there has been this invisible college of adepts and that they have taught the mysteries. And this very much echoes, you know, the kinds of ideas you hear in the perennial tradition, you know, Blavatsky with her Mahatmas and, you know, Eckhart House and Cloud Upon the Sanctuary and so on has these, have these ideas in them as well. But it was in, in Waits' writing that Crowley encountered this idea and decided that he wanted to find this invisible college. And that's why his, his meeting with uh, Julian Baker, um, you know, in, in Switzerland, Julian Baker was the, the fellow climber who was also uh, in, in the Golden Dawn, um, was such a pivotal moment for him. Because he found that at last I had found, you know, I found the entry point to the Invisible College. Crowley was not a fan of Waite's writing style, and he ridiculed and parodied and criticized Waite pretty mercilessly uh, throughout his, you know, Crowley's own writings. You know, he you know, Crowley published this journal called the Equinox. So he had book reviews, and you know, he would give skating reviews of Waite's works in his scholarship and you know he wrote this essay called Waits Wet criticizing, you know, his his writing style as being kind of turgid and, and impenetrable and you know he even wrote a premature obituary called, you know, Dead Weight and so on. So um really really kinda of loved to hate on Wait, but he nevertheless acknowledged that Wait really was the, the the guy who set him on the path, and that and he even says something to the effect that you know if it happened for weight, you know, he may not have ever you know found the way, or and you know, the weight really was kind of the the key to it all for him. People can read weight for themselves and decide if they like his writing style or not. You know, the interesting thing is there's like a new uh, translation of Alphys Levy's uh, uh, Transcendental Magic out there, which weight had once uh, translated. So you know, people can read. You know, Waits version and the the new version by uh, John Michael Greer and I don't know if they're good at French. I can read the original and kind of judge for themselves. You know, Crowley, as we mentioned, you know, he joins the Golden Dawn and he he gets into the order because he meets a guy named uh, George Cecil Jones and he impresses him and some other folks so much with his sort of uh, magical abilities and, th- and that's how he gets into the order. How would you characterize Crowley's time in the Golden Dawn? Well, two things. One, one is that there was part of his time of Golden Dawn that was fairly typical, and there was other ways in which it was controversial. I, I personally think that that Crowley's uh, I don't know, role in the Golden Dawn. I mean, the, Go- the Golden Dawn is important for Crowley, but I don't know that Crowley was all that important in the Golden Dawn story. Although he, he his his role and things that unfolded seems to get kind of. Um, exaggerated, I think. Um, and I guess what I'm referring to is that the Golden Dawn, at the time that Crowley joined, was going through its own sort of political upheavals, and it was on a course of disintegration, which would have happened whether Crowley was there or not. Uh, but because kind of Crowley kind of came in at the you know, during the end game of it all, and he played a role in it, um, his, his role in the you know, destruction of the Golden Dawn seems to, you know, sometimes gets uh, over over uh, stated. But uh, essentially, Crowley came into the Golden Dawn. Uh, his, his time between degrees was about, you know, a month and uh, each. And I guess it's it's worth saying at this point, for, you know, for readers or listeners who uh, are not familiar with the Golden Dawn system, but it's like most of these secret societies. There's like a series of initiations or grades or degrees that one goes through. And as one goes through, you know, progresses in the order, you know, new mysteries are revealed with each initiation. And the, the pace that Crowley took these about one a month um, is fairly typical, I understand. And so in that sense, he was, you know, but, but he took them in a good clip, you know, I mean, there's, he had befriended Alan Bennett who was one of the uh, most respected members of the Golden Dawn, who you know, everyone called the White Knight, and who you know, around whom was all these stories of his magical prowess kind of circulated. And there's just that story of uh, after an initiation and Alan Bennett you know, coming up to Crowley and saying, you know, 
little brother, you've been meddling with the Goetia. And Troy says, oh, no, not me. You know, he has been. And then Alan Bennett's response is simply, well, then the Goetia has been meddling with you. You know, uh, so what are these sorts of, you know, ominous sorts of characters? And Crowley also became very chummy with Samuel Lydell, my brother Mavers, who was the head of the Golden Dawn. So the fact that Crowley kind of befriended these these prominent and powerful people in the order, you know, may have contributed to this perception of him as kind of a, a brown noser, perhaps. But um, he also had some controversy around him because he was he was young, he was an upstart, he was a nonconformist. You know, there were rumors of his various sexual escapades that kind of circulated. You know, William Butler Yeats made some comment to the effect that the Golden Dawn people in London weren't comfortable advancing him to the the grade of Adeptus Minor because they felt that a secret society ought not to be a reformed school, you know, that that, that Crowley was this, this this bad boy and uh you know they they just didn't want to have to deal with him. So there was you know, just his 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 you know, outspoken and colorful character, you know, was 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 part of the politics of what was going on there as well as his you know alliances with people on on various sides of the the splinter that was formed in the Golden Dawn, and um, you know Crowley would would argue that since Yeats and Crowley were both poets, that there was some sort of professional jealousy there. You know Yeats is the one who's won a Nobel Prize, so you know whether there was really any jealousy there or not, you know you. One can wonder, but um, <laughs> there may have also been, you know, some 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 romantic competition between them as well. Just uh, suffice to say, Crowley and Yates did not get along uh, in the Golden Dawn, and, and since Yates was kind of a prominent member in the, the London Lodge, while Mavers, you know, the head of the order, was actually living in Paris at the time, you know, his it was just, you know, there was this tension between Yates and Mavers, and then Crowley was kind of in the Mavers camp, so there was Crowley and Yates were kind of butting heads because they were kind of like oil and vinegar. And then Crowley was also, you know, in Mavers' camp. So they were kind of butting heads there also. So it's uh, it was kind of a complex situation. But, you know, essentially what ends up happening is Mavers wants to kind of consolidate his authority over the people in the Golden Dawn. He doesn't want to come to Paris, or he doesn't want to come to London, or he wants to stay in Paris. So he asks Crowley to serve as his envoy. And... You know, that basically just doesn't go over too well. He tries to seize control of the premises and, you know, the, the Golden Dawn people just get the landlord and he's thrown out, you know. But, uh, you know, that's that's kind of the the, the story of Crowley attempting to, you know, uh, play this role and in, in, in holding together the Golden Dawn and it just winds up splintering apart anyway. And it's, you know, he, he often gets blamed for this. But again, as I said, it would have, it would have happened whether he was there or not, because this had nothing to do with, well, very little to do with Crowley. <laughs> you know, Crowley, I guess the, 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 the biggest issue with Crowley was that the London people did not want to advance him to the grade of Adeptus Minor, which is like the second order, you know, the Burroughs of Crucian grade to the Golden Dawn. So, you know, Mavers said initiate him, they wouldn't. So Crowley came to Paris and, you know, Mavers initiated him himself. And when Crowley came back to London, you know, as a new initiate, they kind of, you know, the London folks kind of thought that was a slap in the face of their, their authority to say, we don't want to do this. And Crowley had, again, likewise, kind of gotten around them by going to his his buddy, you know, so complex politics. And that's you know, it's like that in pretty much any secret society. So it's <laughs> no surprise. And once <laughs> yeah. you look at enough of them, you kind of you see these same sorts of power dynamics and stories play out over and over again. Yeah, you just can't get away from the politics no matter where you go, it seems like. You know, it's yeah. also around this time that Crowley is uh, scaling some rocks at Loch Ness, and he falls in love with this property called Beleskin. What drew his interest to the property, and how did he go about acquiring it? Well, that's an interesting story. Um, yeah, he's, he's climbing around there uh, and comes across this, this manor house. And at this time, he is uh, studying a magical grimoire called the Sacred Magic of Abramel and the Mage, which was a uh, a book that Mavers, you know, the head of the Golden Dawn, had translated and published. And it outlined this process for essentially this this long magical retirement where one kind of again retires from normal life 
lives in this magical temple and goes through this prolonged operation in, in the neighbor's translation. It's um, six months. There have been more urban modern translations that have found, uh, I guess, better uh, manuscripts or more complete manuscripts of the text uh, that, that report the length of time actually being longer than these other texts. But the one that Crowley worked with was a six month retirement of constant prayer and preparation and practicing of conjuring various other entities along the way. And at the end of this, the, the, the whole process was to unite one with one's holy guardian angel. And that this was really kind of the, the work of, of a magical adept. Because once you, you achieve this knowledge and conversation of your holy guardian angel, it's your holy guardian angel that can answer all your questions and instruct you at that point on. You don't really need other teachers uh, in, in your in your life as such. And Curly wanted to try this Abramelin operation, but one of the things it required was a place to retire to, and it had very specific sorts of uh, requirements, like an oratory that faced the east. And when Crowley saw this manor in Loch Ness, he seemed to love the, the environment, but the house satisfied the requirements for Abramelin working, so he decided he wanted to buy the house. So he went up and knocked on the door and asked if the house was for sale. He was told, no, it isn't. And because he was a wealthy young man, he offered twice what the house was worth. And the owners, being no dummies, said, okay, sure, I'll sell you the house for twice its worth. And and thus he, he acquired the home. And, so. you know, that place, that property, has such lore behind it now, I guess because of, you know, what all he got up to while he was there. What sort of effect do you think his magical practices had on the property itself and the land around it? Because... And I've seen some crazy theories like that's what brought the Loch Ness Monster to be. You know the story of Jimmy Page buying the house later and moving into it and doing some of his own magic there probably. But it's just an interesting place to, to read about. I'm just curious from your perspective, what do you think Crowley's occupation of it you know, may have done to the place itself and the property or the land around it? Yeah, I you know, again, I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical about these claims. Certainly, that was an important Twice for Crowley, um, when you read rituals like his Gnostic Mass or or so on, that says that you know the you know east of the temple is oriented toward Boleskine, for example. Um, you know that he, he it's it's almost like that was you know the for for Thelema as you know the Kaaba is you know um, in in Islam that it's you know it's the, the 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 place to which everything is oriented. But oddly enough, it was a for its importance, it was a place where Crowley didn't seem to spend a whole lot of time. Um, he, he did begin the, the Abramelin working there, but he wound up not completing it because you know essentially what happened was he was doing this work and then he wound up being summoned to London by uh, to Paris rather by by Mavers um, to help him with this insurrection in the Golden Dawn. And, you know, Crowley was, was loyal to Mavers at that time. And so he, he abandons the Abermellon operation. So he doesn't, com- doesn't complete that work. It's, it's not until a few years later that he, you know, comes up with a different form of, of that, uh, that holy guardian angel work that, that works for him. But, you know, he, he did, he, he left to do that. He, he went off on two major mountaineering expeditions that, you know, took months to do, you know, he's, he traveled around the world, and um, he and his wife were going through a divorce at one point, and he wasn't really living there. He was living in London, and she was living in the house in uh, Scotland. So uh, his the amount of time he actually spent in there was kind of limited. But because the Abramelin operation you know, involves these working with various forces, yeah, and Crowley, I think in his confessions, he has this passage where he talks about doing the Abramelin working and seeing demons marching around and things like that. But people want to 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 perceive this this property as somehow being, you know, haunted or cursed or have demons living in it. And I just have a hard time thinking that, you know, a place where, you know, Crowley was was again a, a good golden dawn magician, you know, he certainly would have you know, if he did his invocations, he was would have certainly done his banishings and closings at the end. And and it was about two years ago that 
there was a kitchen appliance incident, at least that's what the, the people's best guess is, that caused a fire that burned down the, the property. Uh, at this point, you know, Boleskine had changed hands several times, and it was no longer owned by Jimmy Page. Had had spent some time as a bed and breakfast, and then it was you know private residence, and it was the uh, the owners you know who had this of the private residence who had this uh, unfortunate incident um, right around Christmas time where the house burnt to the ground. It's uh, it's unfortunate because it's a historic site, and you know, again, two years later, no one really seems to know what's going to happen with the property if it's going to be repaired, sold parceled out or what have you. But uh, yeah, there are certain, certainly people who were saying that, oh, it was Abramel and demons that burned down the house. And again, I, I have a hard time imagining that demons are hanging out 100 years after Crowley last called them. You know, it's, it's shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it certainly does, man. It certainly does. So I want to talk a bit about uh, the first time that Crowley goes to Mexico City. You know, there's some interesting details from this visit. Uh, he's doing invisibility experiments, apparently. He's also experimenting further with Enochian magic, which he's already sort of dabbled in. And he actually starts a, a new magical order down there called the Lamp of Invisible Light. But shortly after that, this is the thing about the, the trip I found most curious, was that you said that his interest in ceremonial magic sort of died out. And obviously he rekindles that flame later in life, but what happened here in Mexico specifically? Why did he lose interest in the ceremonial magic? Uh, well, there's various things behind that, and um, I don't think it's entirely attributable to his time in Mexico City, but um, when when the Golden Dawn wound up breaking up, you know, that, that whole incident, you know, left a little bit of a sour taste in his mouth, and Crowley's perception of Mavers kind of fell a little bit uh, in his estimation, and his mentor, Alan Bennett, who I talked about earlier, you know, the late night, you know, uh, he was having some serious health issues. He had asthma and was having a hard time, you know, again, just living and breathing in, in London. And he needed to move to a different location. And there's a, there's a story about Crowley trying to summon, you know, again, a goetic spirit to help heal his, his friend. Um, but it apparently didn't work because Alan did wind up moving. And what he did was he moved to Kashmir and became a Buddhist monk. And uh, in much the same way that Crowley was kind of following and emulating, you know, Mavers and, you know, uh, you know, in fact, you know, they, again, you know, the name that Mavers went by was Samuel McGregor Mavers or Samuel Lydell McGregor Mavers. And, um, Crowley at one point, you know, starts adding, you know, the McGregor to his name. You know, he 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 certainly was just as subject to, you know, hero worship, I suppose, uh, as if you want to call it that, as any of us are. So in the, in the same sense, he kind of was emulating, you know, his his magical mentor, you know, McGregor Mathers, um, when Alan Bennett moved, you know, to the the Near East and took up Buddhism. Crowley kind of followed suit and became a Buddhist himself, and 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 so became much more you know rational and um, you know less less magically inclined than he had been previously. You know, it was also around this time that um, he you know he's climbing mountains in Mexico with Oscar Eckenstein, who I mentioned earlier, and who's again also saying telling Crowley that he's too undisciplined and that he needs to focus on concentration and. You know, gives him some exercises to try that are very much in line with, you know, hatha yoga sort of exercises. So Crowley's attention suddenly shifts from ceremonial magic to paying a lot more serious attention to Buddhism and Hinduism and then yoga. Um, all of which I think it's worth pointing out are relatively unknown in the West at this time. Alan Bennett um, is, in fact, considered to be one of the first. Buddhist missionaries to the West when he comes to London in uh, around 1908, I believe it is. So in that sense, Crowley and a lot of the, the occultists at the time, you know, the theosophists, the the people who founded the, the OTO and so on, they were they were all kind of hip to the, the the what was happening with yoga, but was still relatively unknown in in, in Europe at this time, which would be around 1900, 1901, 1902. 
it was basically just in um, 1897, I believe, 1896, 1897, that Patanjali's, you know, books on yoga and, you know, and, and you know, some of the other big writers on, on yoga, you know, actually start to get published in, in the West. So it's, you know, it's still kind of a, a, a largely unknown practice, but it was something that Crowley embraced. And now we didn't embrace it. He actually wound up traveling to India to hang out with, with Alan Bennett and study under him and some of Alan's teachers. Yeah. And the other thing I found interesting and while he's in Mexico is that he has a book of poetry that's getting ready to be published called The Soul of Osiris, and it's garnering some pretty nice reviews and publicity when it comes out, or prior to it coming out too. And I was curious if you would say that at this point, has Crowley established himself as a poet on par with some of the best of this era? You know, when people talk about Crowley's best works, generally it's, it's, Stuff that comes a little bit later. I mean, well, actually, one of the poems he wrote in Mexico City was one called La Gicana. And that was one that uh, J.F.C. Fuller, toward the end of his life, looked back and said it was one of Crowley's best poems. So I think Crowley was certainly coming into his own at this point and finding his voice. You know, his early stuff was very much emulative. You know, he was very much copying and doing things in the style of Keats and Shelley and Swinburne and. Byron and, and, and those people that he, he so admired. And, you know, one of the, the, the critiques that then leveled at Crowley, perhaps, is that you know, since he, he basically wrote these poems and paid himself to have them published, you know, these weren't published through, you know, a, these didn't go through the conventional editorial process. He basically just self-published or, you know, did the Vanity Press thing, if you want to call it that that he may have, some people said that he may have benefited from an editor who could give him some feedback and cut out some of the weaker stuff. But what you wind up seeing, and I think that the benefit of this is you do kind of see Crowley works and all as you go through his poetic works, you do see how he changes and improves and, um, you know, with each subsequent book. So um, he certainly, what he's writing at this time is better than what had come before, but I think that's a, something that continues, you know, as he continues, he hones his craft over the course of his lifetime. You know, at, at the end of his life, he put out a book called Ola, an anthology of 60 years in song. And essentially what it contains is just like the highlights of poetry he's written over literally 60 years of his life, kind of going back to, you know, the era of death of a drunkard, you know, the, the stuff he wrote as, you know, a child basically up to his old age. So it's a pretty impressive record. You know, also you, when you think that it was 1905 to 1907 in those years that he put out a, a, a three volume set of his collected works, which was almost entirely poetry. You know, he was 30 years old at that time. And then he had three volumes of collected works already done. So he had, he had certainly, uh, you know, gotten quite a lot of poetry under his belt at a pretty young age. Definitely, yeah. And, you know, poets always have this romantic impulse, so it's a good time, I think, to ask, uh, who was Rose Kelly, and how did she and Alistair meet? All right, well, Rose Kelly is Alistair Crowley's first wife, and she was the brother of one of his college buddies, Gerald Kelly. Gerald Kelly was studying art and painting while Crowley was studying. Crowley was studying to be in the, the diplomatic mission, but kind of decided against that and ultimately dropped out of college before he, before graduating. But, you know, Crowley and Gerald were buddies and that one, you know, hanging out at one of the Kelly family gatherings, um, he, he meets Rose and they strike up a conversation and Rose confides in him that, you know, she's kind of facing a dilemma because, you know, she has these suitors coming to, to see her who would like to marry her. And, and she's not really into any of them because there's this married guy that she's having an affair with and that's who she really loves. And so she's not sure what to do. And Crowley, again, being this romantic poet, but also being a pragmatist, offers her a solution. And his solution is, well, I tell you what, why don't you just marry me? We'll just do this for appearances, and you can just carry on your affair with whoever you want, and that'll get you off the hook. 
And she says, sure, let's do that. <laughs> so uh, early in the morning, they sneak off the family compound and go into town and get married. And, you know, the family is furious, um, but what's done is done. And they, you know, for appearances, they go off on a honeymoon and uh, realize in the course of this trip that, they actually are in love with each other. And, um, and so, you know, the story goes from there. Um, part of their honeymoon involved a trip to Cairo and, and Egypt, um, but specifically in Cairo where uh, Crowley is, you know, showing off for Rose and demonstrating some of the magic stuff that he had done. And this seems to trigger something in Rose that causes her to enter the sort of trance-like state. And, what winds up happening is she begins saying that there's that there are these spirits who want to talk to him, that they have a message for him. And as this goes on, she starts getting more and more specific, and she's talking about Horus, you know, the Egyptian hawk-headed god, and saying that Horus has a message. And Crowley's very skeptical about all of this, and but at the same time, is trying to curious because Rose, you know, did not have any kind of education in mythology or magic or Egypt or anything like that. So he's, he finds it curious that she would be bringing this stuff up. So he begins to interrogate her, you know, and say, well, who, who is Horus? Who are his friends? Who are his enemies? What's his number? What's his color? And um, all of that sort of stuff. And to his much to his surprise, he's able to answer, she, you know, she answers all of these questions correctly. And, you know, he kind of figures the odds of this happening just randomly is infinitesimally small, you know, that, that, that this, this can't just be a coincidence. So his last test is to take her to the museum in Cairo and say, point out to me an image of, of Horus. And, you know, as the story goes, they're wandering around the museum and, you know, she walks past several prominent images of Horus and Crowley's kind of like, ha ha, here we go. You know, this, this is all falling apart now. And then she points to this wooden funerary stele uh, across the room and says, here, that's, that's him. And Crowley goes up to the funerary stele, sees it is, does in fact depict Horus. But what strikes him even more is that this funerary stele has exhibit number 666, which uh, resonates for him. And so rather than, you know, him having caught, you know, Rose or whatever in some bizarre coincidence. In fact, this is like the straw that convinces him that, yes, there is indeed something going on, um, that somehow there are entities who are communicating with him through her. And um, basically the instruction he gets is to go into the, the room. They, they were renting the flat while they were in Egypt. So they were, they were here for like several months um, on their honeymoon. And, um, so he used to go into his flat at that, you know, into this, the sitting room, sit at the desk at noon and to write down what he hears. And he used to do this on three days, April 8th, 9th, and 10th. And what he winds up hearing and writing down is this, this text called the Book of the Law, which is the, the cornerstone of the philosophy of Thelema, the magical, religious, philosophical uh, system that uh, Crowley propounded for the rest of his life. And Crowley essentially saw this as being a revelation for a new age, essentially, in that he was the chosen prophet to you know, promulgate these teachings. So that's Rose Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. And I have to thank you for taking as much time as you did here to give us a, a nice overview of his life and his work and his magic and his poetry and just everything that made him who he was. Before we go here, tell people where they can find the book and where they can keep up with your work if they're interested. All right. Well, um, I'd say, again, once again, I, I, I enjoyed the talk and I feel like we've really only scratched the surface. But you know, again, with a character as complex as Crowley, that's about as much as we could expect to do in a, even in a couple of hours as we did. But um, yeah, my book is Perdurabo and um, is published by North Atlantic Books and you can find it through your favorite bookseller, wherever that may be. And if you uh, want to keep up with me, um, you can find me under my name, Richard Kaczynski, um, both at Facebook and Twitter. So um, I'm pretty active on social media and 
There's also a Facebook page uh, for the book Perdurabo where I uh, share articles and posts and things uh, that are, you know, news events and whatnot that are, uh, that are relevant to the world of Aleister Crowley. Well, Dr. Kaczynski, thanks again for your time. I look forward to speaking to you again sometime soon if you're up for it. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was, this was a blast. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Richard Kaczynski. All the pertinent links are in the show notes. And if you only heard the free show here, but you know Crowley's later work somewhat, isn't it interesting how those three early interests, poetry, chess, and mountain climbing, sort of define him as a character? You have the romantic impulse of a poet, the sheer will of a mountaineer, and the calculated nature of a chess player. You can see how he embodied those traits throughout his life. I will say that any character reservations about him shouldn't completely discredit his work. That ad hominem sort of stuff is for the birds, really. That's a product of a culture now where we live more in the age of reputation than we do in the age of information. That said, on the Book of the Law, if you're familiar with the story behind its creation and its content specifically, to me, that's a brilliant way to get people to follow your teachings. I mean, you say, hey, here are these channeled messages I got. Don't shoot the messenger, guys, but we should probably take these seriously because they came from a higher being than me. And this higher being just also happened to say that eh, I'm the prophet of this new age. So, I don't know. It seems like a clever way to get people through the doors, so to speak. And as someone who works in marketing, I'd like to think I know good marketing when I see it. And this seems like it could be that regardless of the actual nature of the text. So forgive me if I am a bit skeptical of it still. I don't think that detracts from the general message in the book itself. I can get down with the do what thou wilt mantra as long as you're not infringing on the rights or the will of others and as long as you are really truly honoring your capital S self. And hey, if you missed the Patreon extension, it was damn near another full hour with Richard. We talked more about the content of the Book of the Law, the formation of the Silver Star, Crowley's intelligence connections, joining the OTO, his relationship with Jack Parsons, the influence of theosophy and general Eastern mysticism on him, and why he's still so influential even today. And there were a slew of new patrons that heard that extension, and I have to give some shoutouts to them. So my thanks to Simon... Jordan, Robin, Nick, Andre, James, Reconciliatio, Kevin, and my friend Grimstake. And a huge thank you to Megan Finnett and Dunzo for becoming official executive producers of the show. A few interesting names this week. A lot of nicknames, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce any of them. But you too can join all these fine folks in supporting this show at patreon.com slash occulture. And just a reminder, for $10 and $20 patrons, don't forget Oak Culture Picture Show debuts this Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. Looks like we'll be screening a dark song. And if you're interested in joining us, there's still some time to sign up and do so. Again, patreon.com slash occulture. So I will see some of you on Saturday night. And the rest of you, well, until next time, you've just been initiated into Oak Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you that loving yourself is the law. That thinking for yourself is the law. That questioning authority is the law. And to do what thou fucking wilt. Oh, my God.
this cassette.